can tell it how Okay, thanks everybody um, for joining us today. Um, so it's uh, my pleasure to introduce uh, Julia Shades. Uh, has been in my research group for I think about five years now, um, working on um, a variety of problems related to snowfall and also field work, um, going and gathering data um, from ground-based instruments and looking at various properties of several different types of snow um, around the world. You, you may remember uh, Julia's master's work, which was looking at snow events in Scandinavia and contrasting different types of snowfall regimes there. Uh, today she's going to talk about some work a little bit closer to home, and I know she participated in the deployment of these instruments in Marquette, Michigan. Um, so she, she's going to talk to you about a slightly different problem, but related. Um, but by way of a little bit of background, um, Julia got her uh, bachelor's in Earth System Science at UC Irvine um, back in 2015. Uh, while she was doing that work, and one of the things that um, I would say led me to make her an offer to come here uh, was she had done two um, research projects, one with Gudrun Magnus' daughter um, at UC Irvine, and the other an REU uh, with Libby Barnes at Colorado State. Um, and so she had a lot of research experience, had some interest in looking at um, polar uh, connections to mid-latitudes, and so I think it was a really good fit for her to join my group. Um, by way of a little bit of personal information about Julia, one theme that I've noticed kind of throughout her both accomplishments here and also her interest here is the outdoors. Um, and so she uh, spent, like I said, a lot of time in the field as part of her graduate school studies um, deploying instruments. She did an Arctic summer field school, actually I guess it was two of them, right, consecutive years, um, in Fairbanks, Alaska. And, oh, that's uh, how to pronounce it, <laughs> um, um, Alaska. Um, and also, um, she, I, and I, this I just learned before grad school, actually worked as an outdoor science instructor, which sounds like an ideal job, um, where you just go hike with kids and teach them science while on the trails of uh, San Bernardino Mountains in California. That is a fantastic little nugget that I didn't know. Um, and then her favorite activities here in Madison, keeping with that same theme, are canoeing, kayaking, and stand-up paddle boarding outside of the, the lakes here. So anyway, without any um, additional uh, ado here, um, I just want to introduce uh, the title of Julia's presentation, which is a multi-year analysis of precipitation phase transition height in Marquette, Michigan. And she'll probably provide you a little bit of the backstory of why this is important. But one of the uh, things we're very interested in here is what kind of uncertainties we have in satellite observations of snow of precipitation phase at the surface where there's typically a blind zone of about a kilometer which we can't really see. Um, and so I think this work, um, in, in addition to understanding the, the processes of precipitation in that lowest layer of the atmosphere, um, lowest kilometer of the atmosphere, also may help us um, to improve our satellite-based retrieval algorithms in the future. Tristan, Hi. could you catch that middle light switch over there? Right. Thank you, Tristan, for that introduction. Um, when I first got started here, I was studying snowfall, and I'm happy to now share some work on rainfall. Um, okay, so precipitation is changing in a warming climate, and um, a lot of it is increasing. There's increased precipitation. But there's also a shift from snow to rain, and that would have an impact on water resources, global energy balance, snowpack, and um, here in the Midwest, it impacts our watersheds. So we have reduced snow water equivalent and snowpack because of an increase in rain. And um, also locally, the type of precipitation we get at the surface, whether it's um, rain or snow, or freezing rain or sleet, impacts the safety and transportation. So um, there's a risk in driving in different types of weather. Um, so the rain that I'm interested in in this work is a stride form of rainfall. So um, what's important with this type of rainfall is we have snow processes a lot. So we have um, bigger deposition type processes. So we have ice crystals growing, falling, aggregating, and then as they approach warmer temperatures, they begin to melt and then become rainfall at the surface. And so one of the um, interesting features of stratiform rainfall is um, in this melting area, we can detect it in the radar, and it's called a bright band. 
And bright bands have been recognized in radar observations since radar has been known to capture meteorological phenomena. So this is a paper from 1950 from Pauline Austin and Ellen Dumas looking at the bright band in radar precipitation echoes and in their, you know, their short abstract here, um, speculating the melting of snowflakes provides an adequate explanation of the phenomena. And what I really like here is older imagery from radar um, of an RHI scan um, where we can see a well-defined bright band in the radar imagery. And then also, here's another um, image from old uh, radar observations of um, radar image where the antenna is pointed vertically. So we have a vertically profiling observation where we can see that it's a signal intensity or we see a bright band um, below the signal example. So bright band has been studied and known about for a while. Um, the height where we see melting occurring in the atmosphere is important for the precipitation we get at the surface. And so the melt level height is changing in a warming climate. And this impacts the in an increase in precipitation intensity at the, at the surface, so um, with an increase in the warm cloud layer. And then also um, in places where there's terrain, um, and mountains, we get rainfall in the place of snowfall, um, leading to less snowpack, um, impact stream flow. And um, from a lot of part, uh, a lot of the world, we can see that there's a change in melt level height happening. So um, all this red is indicating an increase in melt level height per meters per, ten, uh, meters per decade. And um, so we have satellite observations that can uh, measure uh, precipitation nearly globally, and there are different ways of detecting the type of phase and um, the bright band in radar observations, and, and the type of phase we see uh, with precipitation is important because that uh, is important for retrievals, knowing are we using a drop size distribution, are we using a particle size distribution, um, and that's important for a retrieval. And so here's a nice figure that I really like from um, satellite observations, it's from GPM, GPR. Um, from Canada et al. 2017, and we can see that this is mean bright band height. And so we can see a, a, a latitudinal dependence on the, um, the bright band where melting is happening. So higher latitudes we're seeing a more shallow bright band. And that's really important if we're thinking about where, where's changes happening um, of warming climate. But we have a challenge. It's Tristan brought up. We have the satellite radar blind zone. So here's a schematic I've included that illustrates this blind zone not to scale, and um, it's showing here that the um, first 500 meters to two kilometers above the surface, we get unreliable measurements from um, satellite observations. And so here's kind of, in the schematic, we have our satellite radar, it's looking down, we see a snowing cloud, the top of another cloud, but from a ground-based perspective, we're seeing actually this snowing cloud has melting closer to the surface, and we're getting rainfall. And this shallow little cloud here is snowing over mountains. And so um, those are some of the challenges the radar. So it leads us to these questions of what is the precipitation phase at the surface? Are we getting precipitation at the surface? And uh, when we are getting precipitation change, how is that rate changing with height? So ground-based observations provide um, a nice you know, perspective to what's going on closer to the surface. So you might be thinking, okay, we have satellite observations nearly globally. Why don't we just use those observations and stick a temperature threshold on it and say, if it's below zero, it's snowing. If it's above zero, it's raining. But actually, phase discrimination and temperature is also not straightforward. So we, um, this plot is showing um, the surface temperature thresholds for 50% chance of rain or snow. We're seeing that it varies regionally. Uh, so the surface temperature threshold itself varies. And also, that zero degree Celsius does not effectively separate rain and snow. Um, and also another um, important variable for deciding whether it's rain or snow or impacting it uh, is not just temperature, but it's relative humidity. So um, at lower relative humidity, you'd expect um, snowfall and sublimation rather than melting at the same temperature. And so a variable that uh, multiple studies have been using in place of temperature to separate rain and snow is wet bulb temperature. And that's because it allows us to account for the temperature and pressure and um, multiple studies use it to discriminate rain and snow at the surface. And then um, wet bulb temperature is also used to identify the onset of melting or melt level height. And then also uh, wet bulb temperature can be used in satellite retrievals. Um, looking at freezing melting level 
And then the two meter wet bulb temperature has been shown to improve phase discrimination, discrimination for um, GPM DPR observations. And in a lot of situations, the wet bulb temperature is combined with other variables, um, including a near surface lapse rate. It's been shown to be effective. So that brings me to my questions for this work. And how does the height of the precipitation phase transition vary throughout the year? What differences do we see in the macro and microphysical properties of rainfall as a function of the phase transition height? And then how can these observations be coupled with ancillary measurements like temperature and wet bulb temperature from reanalyses to better address uncertainties and retrievals of surface precipitation time? So first, let's just go over a couple definitions. So when I use them, we're all on the same page. And, um, let's start with the mount level height. So it's traditionally thought of as the altitude of the zero degree Celsius isotherm. It's where particles and particles begin to melt. Uh, it's the top of the melting layer. Um, but we're going to be using wet bulb temperature when I say melt level, uh, and that's been shown to be effective in a lot of studies. Then we have a melting layer, and so that's referencing an actual interval of where snow is melting to rain. It's not instantaneous. It happens over time and over distance. And then I've used the word wet bulb temperature a few times, but a small reminder of what that means. It's the temperature to which air is cooled by ev evaporation at a constant rate. And it can be measured by a sling psychrometer, which I show pictured here. Um, I, that's a picture from one of the AOS sling psychrometers on the rooftop. And uh, bright band, I've mentioned it before. It's a signature of the melting layer in a radar reflectivity. Then uh, the title of my talk uses this phrase, so precipitation phase transition height. And that's the snow to rain level defined through a Doppler velocity by the radar. Um, essentially, it matches up with the bottom of the melting layer. So this is, I'm interested in, okay, when is the melting essentially complete? When are we looking at mostly rain? In order to answer these questions, I'm using observations from Marquette, Michigan, which is a site in the Upper Great Lakes region, uh, and multiple studies, Patterson et al., uh, Cooley et al., and Matt et al., used um, observations from this site to study snowfall, and then also recently atmospheric river events. Uh, at this site, or, uh, I'm using observations from 2014 to April 2020. So at this site, um, our instrument suite includes a microwave radar, which is a vertically profiled and Doppler radar, which here. We have a precipitation imaging package, which is a custom NASA video astrometer. And let me zoom in on this picture so you can see that uh, closer up. So the precipitation imaging package consists of a camera and a light where we get videos of um, some flakes and raindrops falling through this volume. And then we have surface meteorological observations and um, of two meter temperature and two meter dew point, in which we get our uh, two meter wet bulb temperature. And then um, we have reanalysis products. So we're using ECM ECMWF Air 5 and Mar NASA's Merit 2, where we're looking at the vertical profiles of temperature and relative humidity. So let's get familiar with the micro rain radar, the MRR. So the MRR is a vertically profiled radar, so it's capturing precipitation as it falls towards it. And here's an example of a rain, to, a rain to snow transition event where we have height on the y-axis and we have time elapsed on the x-axis. And the color indicates the radar reflectivity. So the actual signal of the radar reflectivity depends on the number of drops, how big the drops are, or um, particles if we're looking at snow, and how massive they are, and the cities, of course. Um, so then we have another variable from the Doppler spectra from the MRR is the Doppler velocity. And the Doppler velocity measures the precipitation, the velocity of the, falling, the air column falling towards the radar when the precipitation. Then we have another variable, which I won't be um, showing later today in this presentation, but we have the spectral width, which is a measure of the variance of the radar, of the Doppler velocity. Okay, so let's get familiar now with the PIP. So the PIP is a video distrometer. So um, we can get videos, these are raw videos from the PIP of a rainfall event up here on the left and a snowfall event on the right. And we can see differences in um, like the sizes of the particles, the sizes of the drops, how quickly they're falling and how many there are. And those are some of the products we get from the PIP. So processing these videos gives us drop size distributions, fall speeds, effective density of the particles, which then gets us the phase of the particle. And then we can um, obtain rain rates in liquid water equivalent or snow rates in liquid water equivalent. And one of the key features that you might notice um, either just 
noticing from rainfall and snowfall from your experience from these videos is that rain has a higher fall speed than snow. And so um, that is the uh, key difference that sort of motivates my, how I separate rain and snow. Okay. Um, now to defining how I um, identify phase transition heights. So um, other work has looked at multiple different variables. So we have radar reflectivity, we have skewness in the Doppler spectra, we have Doppler velocity, signal to noise ratio. There's a lot of different variables that people use to identify phase transition or melting. And this um, paper from White et al. 2002 showed um, using the Doppler velocity. So here I'm showing height on the y axis, or they're showing height on the y axis, and they have Doppler velocity and signal to noise ratio. And we can see that this melting level is associated with a gradient or a change of Doppler velocity with height. And that's what I would be doing. So here is an example of a rain event in June and a rain event in November. So here's a June event, and we have um, height on the y axis for all the plots, hours plots on the x axis. And then for these top two plots, it's radar reflectivity. And what we can see is the bright band and the radar reflectivity. And then in June, it's higher than what it is in November for this event. And uh, what really stands out to me is really dramatic is the Doppler velocity change. So snowfall fall, uh, falling towards the radar accelerates a lot as it gets closer to this bright band, uh, right at the bright band it's accelerating. So we see that there's a transition in phase. So to detect it in a sort of a flowchart way here, we first identify that there's radar, that there is a precipitation event at all, using the radar reflectivity. Then we identify if it's raining or snowing by using a threshold for Doppler velocity at three meters per second. And then we look at the gradient of the Doppler velocity profiles with respect to height. So let's take a look at those profiles. So here we have height in the y-axis, Doppler velocity on the x-axis. And the tomato colored line is for November. This teal one is June. So we can see the do how the Doppler velocity changes with height once it reaches a phase transition. So we can see a dramatic increase in height. Right here, we see a dramatic increase um, of Doppler velocity. And so we take that um, varying with respect to height, and we can see an inflection point that exceeds our threshold value, and that is our precipitation phase transition height. And so here's how that. Um, actually lines up on the Doppler velocity and on the radar reflectivity. So we apply this method onto about six years of observations, and we get a distribution of heights. And so let me explain what's on this plot. So we have height on the y-axis, and each of these boxes is a month in the year. And the, um, there's one half violin plot on there, maybe hard to see, they're like blue, but it's showing the empirical distribution of phase transition heights. And the solid lines are means, and the dots are medians. So right away, we can answer our first question: What does the height of the, what is, how does the height of the precipitation phase transition vary throughout the year? So right, away we can answer this question. We say, okay, we have higher PPTH in summer months, and we have lower PPTH or phase transition heights in winter months, and that makes sense if we think about how the um, surface temperature, um, how that affects the phase transition. But really what's interesting here is the spread in phase transition height in our fall and spring months, especially October. So let's take a look at October for a second. October has phase transition heights that are as low as 6, uh, 0.6 kilometers per half a kilometer above ground level, and then up to three kilometers above ground level. You might be wondering what's going on above three kilometers above ground level. And that's actually um, something the radar cannot detect. The operating range height of the radar is three kilometers. So for these summer months, these means actually don't reflect like the actual full summer. Those are just from what the radar can detect. So remember that satellite radar blind zone? It's around two kilometers, or 0.7 to two kilometers. Well, all of this, um, these phase transitions could be obscured within the satellite radar blind zone. Something to keep in mind. Uh, all right. So we have these questions we started, we answered our first one, and now we're interested in our rainfall characteristics for these different phase transition heights. And so the way um, we address this next question is by separating these phase transition heights into separate height categories. So uh, each one of these rectangles around a, uh, the box and whisker plot are um, the height categories. So here are my height categories. 
you would know. So each height category is 0.6 kilometers in, in a height range or bin, and um, this is the occurrence of them. So I've included here undetected phase transition height. And I don't show it in this presentation, but I have looked at what months that's happening. And um, summer months primarily have, uh, there's like 60% of rain events in the summer that have undetected phase transition heights that the radar can't detect. And that's just because it's above three kilometers. Away. And so um, looking at these height categories and looking at the occurrence, we can see about 25% of the rain occurrence or phase transition occurrence happens below two kilometers from ground level. That's a, good amount of rain that might not be detected, or that phase transition might not be detected by a satellite radar. Okay. So let's look at some rainfall characteristics in the MRR. Yes. Julia, I don't know if you're going to come back to this, so I wanted okay. to ask, what about this little dip from October to November then arise back in December and January? That uh, is a good question, and I'm not 100% sure. So with the height, just basically the height here, why is this yeah, right here? Yeah, I'm looking at the mean especially, yeah. So, I haven't looked at any, you know, case by case, like, let's see what's going on with these specific cases. Yeah. Um, I'm thinking that it could be atmospheric river events associated with some, um, so Matt Ling et al. 2021 showed that there are atmospheric river events um, in this region that lead to rainfall in the cold season. Okay. So I'm thinking maybe that's associated with Oh, all right. That's um, interesting. So I'm, I'm, that's, a, that's sort of a guess right now, but um, I think it'd be interesting to look at those, those specific events. Thanks. Okay, so let's look a little bit more at the radar observations. So we looked at these time by height radar observations, but now let's not look at radar observations with time dimension, but let's compress it into histograms. So what I'm showing here in all of these, there's height on the y-axis, and here we have reflectivity on the x-axis. And the color is a frequency. So what it's showing us is how does the reflect, radar reflectivity change with height. And um, what I'm showing you with the like A, B, C, and D, we have the higher phase transitions higher up, and then as we get closer to the bottom of the screen, we're getting closer to lower phase transitions. So one of the things that stands out in the radar reflectivity is we can see a bright band. And we would hope to see a bright band, right? Because we're seeing stratiform rainfall with um, melting occurring in the column. So we see kind of a notch in the radar reflectivity that corresponds to a bright band. Then, um, for phase transitions above 1.8 kilometers, so A and B here, this one, um, we have higher near surface reflectivity that actually gets to 30 dBz and exceeds 30 dBz, whereas on the other hand, uh, we have slightly lower um, reflectivities for near surface phase transitions. Uh, one thing that I do, I did find interesting, thinking about snowfall and, and after a few years of looking at snow, we see a gradual increase in the radar reflectivity towards the um, phase transition height or towards the melting, and so I think we could be seeing some, uh, some of the snowfall aggregating as it falls towards the radar. Next, we have the Doppler velocity. So now we still have height on the y-axis, but Doppler velocity is on the x-axis, and the color is still a frequency. And, um, we see a strong transition in the, in the Doppler velocity associated with phase transition, which is, of course makes sense. We use that as our, as our method to identify phase transition, but it's really stunning to see that um, snowfall Doppler velocity from zero to 2.6, and then a sudden increase in the Doppler velocities for rainfall. And um, something that does stand out though in the difference between the height categories is that for higher phase transitions, we're seeing higher Doppler velocities towards the surface which impacts our um, you know, considering rain rates and so All right, so we looked at the MRR observations. Now let's look at the microphysical characteristics of rainfall at the surface from the pit. So um, remember I mentioned that um, from that video, from processing it, we got a drop size distribution, which tells us the number of drops for a size within that volume. So it's a concentration. And what I'm showing here is a mean drop size distribution four different phase transition heights. So we have um, the number concentration on a log scale on the y-axis, we have the diameter on the x-axis, the drop diameter, and one of the things that stands out right away to me 
is the fact we have a higher number of small drops for higher phase transitions, so that above 1.8 kilometers of a level. And what I um, think is happening is as these drops are falling, they melt, they fall, and they begin to collide and break up. So we have a higher number of small drops. And here's a nice figure from um, paper 1996 showing the process of melting snowflake, but in kerosene. And um, you can see as the snowflake melts, it starts to break up and have lots of little drops. Yes. Why do they collide and not coalesce? They so anti-coalesce. They, it's, it's, it is happening. Uh, both coalescence, so coalescence collisions and breakup are all happening simultaneously. Oh, okay, but breakup is pre preferred, maybe. So, I don't think that these observations can necessarily say that it's for sure, you know, only breakup and only coalescence. There's a number of studies that kind of compare what happens when okay. you have um, collisions and coalescence versus only coalescence. But um, when you have these collisions, you also have breakup. Okay. Yeah. Um, that answer the question. Okay. Um, okay. <laughs> so we then um, can look at these lower phase transitions, and we're seeing a higher number of larger drops. Let's go ahead and look at the fall speeds for that. So from the tip, we get our fall speed. And uh, it's on the y-axis here. And we still have our equivalent drop diameters on the x-axis. And one of the things that stands out is as we get to larger drops, for lower phase transitions, we have lower fall speeds. And so for large drops, we might expect deformed drops that are influenced by drag that um, fall more slowly towards the surface. But also, if we have any partially melted um, snowflakes or aggregates, those would also be impacted by drag and be larger than a spherical raindrop. So now, um, I mentioned that we can get rain rates from the PIP. And on the y-axis here, I'm showing logged in counts, just the count. And on the x-axis, we have rain rates. And so one thing that stands out here is that higher phase transitions have higher rain rates which is consistent with a lot of work that says a higher melt level would have a higher rate. Okay, so what we want to do next is connect the near surface MRI reflectivity to the PIP rain rates. And so what I'm showing here is another type of 2D histogram where we have near surface reflectivity from the MRR on the y-axis, and then all of these x-axes have rain rates from the PIP. And the color are bin counts. And one of the reasons why we'd be interested in connecting this near surface reflectivity with a rain rate is to obtain a relationship between them to say, okay, when we have this kind of radar reflectivity, this is the sort of rain rate we'd expect. And let's take a look at 25 dBz, for example. And we can see that there's some differences in the height categories about what kind of rain rate you get from 25 dBz. So for a shallow phase transition, which are these, these um, this is below 1.8 kilometers, this is above 1.8 kilometers. We can see that for 20, um, 25 dBz, we'd have a lower rain rate, so below, uh, around one, below one millimeter per hour for 25 dBz. Then as we get to higher phase transitions, we see that there are higher, so this, the darker color means there's a higher number of observations <coughs> for that rain rate at that reflectivity. So we can see that we have higher rain rates above one millimeter per hour for the same given reflectivity. So there's a quantitative way of describing that relationship. It's called a zeta r relation. So it's, um, we relate the radar reflectivity factor to a rain rate, and uh, this is a sort of well-known um, zeta r relation, zeta r relation, called the marshall palmer strata form, zeta r, and it's consistent with this exponential drop size distribution. So what we did, and I'll explain this figure. There's a lot happening on this slide, so I'll go through it. Don't worry. Um, so we have empirically derived zeta r from MRR near surface reflectivity and PIP rain rates. And what we want to do is compare the types of zeta r we get from these different phase transition height categories to operationally used radar reflectivity zeta r relations. So on all of these plots, I have rain rates on the y-axis and then reflectivity on the x-axis. And then I include um, sort of well-known operational zeta r, like a cool season stratiform rain rate that's used at Marquette. 
um, for the, the weather radar there. Um, a summer deep convective one, just to compare some con convective relationship. And then the Marshall Palmer Stratiform one that I mentioned. So those are on the black lines. Then, on this, um, these top two plots, I'm looking at the zeta r curves and how they compare to the other zeta r for lower phase transition heights. So um, the little plus signs are the mean rain rates from the pit, and the solid colorful lines are the empirically derived zeta r um, curves. And uh, it's really nice to see how well those zeta r that are empirically derived from the MRR pit, how those match up with cool season stratiform uh, zeta r relations. So for these types of rain rates, you can see that a radar is really using uh, a zeta r, cool season stratiform rain for that, for this type of phase transition that works. Great. Um, however, for um, our two higher phase transition, these are both um, one above 1.8 kilometers above ground level, we're seeing um, here, uh, again, we plot the mean rain rate and the um, empirically derived zeta r. If we were to use a cool season stratiform C to R or a Marshall Palmer stratiform C to R, we'd actually be underestimating the rainfall at the surface. So um, these curves show, and the, and the mean um, rain rates show that. They're all higher rain rates for that given reflectivity. Okay, so that brings us back to our questions. And, and um, let's address that question of those rainfall characteristics. So we do see differences in the microphysical characteristics, so in the PIP, and we also see differences in the uh, macrophysical characteristics in the MRR. And we also see these differences in the ZR relations that are from those differences in the microphysical characteristics. And, and so it kind of separates out into differences between shallow phase transitions below 1.8 kilometers above ground level, and then also what I started to call intermediate phase transitions. Um, so our next question then is how can these observations be coupled with ancillary measurements uh, and reanalyses to better address uncertainties? And let's revisit this slide from the intro uh, on wet bulb temperature because for this next part, I'm interested in um, melt level heights from reanalyses and the onset of melting, so melt, the melt level height. And then I'm also interested in the two meter wet bulb temperature and how those connect to those uh, rainfall events. So for this next slide, we'll be looking at reanalysis derived melt level heights and comparing those to the MRR phase transition heights. So let me first explain one plot before I show them all. Um, uh, we have scatter plots of MRR phase transition heights on the y-axis and then the reanalysis melt level heights on the x-axis giving us the scatter plots. So this is at a wet bulb temperature in the profile of zero degrees Celsius. And so we can see it's a um, high Pearson correlation coefficient. They relate well enough with one another. Uh, and so we have ERA 5 and MARA 2. And so these are all of them. I, uh, for the study, I looked at 0 degrees Celsius, 0 0.5 degrees Celsius, and then also 1 degree Celsius. And um, the 1 degree Celsius mount level height, or height of the 1 degree wet bulb isotherm, agrees best with the 1 to 1 line between the um, MRR, PPTH, and the reanalysis melt level heights. Okay. So now, let's take a look at what's going on at two meters of the surface. So, um, and the two meter wet bulb temperature. So here showing you another box and whisker plot where we have wet bulb temperature on the y-axis, and then we have all um, groupings of height categories. So our 0 0.6, 1 1.2, 1 1.2, 1.8, 1.8 to 2.4, and 2.43 kilometers above ground level. And I'm comparing surface observations and ERA-5 and MERA-2. And uh, what stands out is that the MERA-2 and ERA-5 are colder, for the, so their means are colder than the surface measurements for three of these height categories. So these solid lines are the means. So for these, um, like the shallow phase transitions, we use our surface mean, um, like four and maybe five and a half, and, or 5.5, 5, 5, yeah. And um, the means for ERA-5 and MERA-2 are colder than the surface measurements. And this has been shown with MERA-2 that it has a cold bias, but what we're seeing here also is that ERA-5 seems to be colder as well than the surface observation. Um, also, another thing that stands out is the whiskers 
um, showing that dis distribution down to the percentile uh, do go below zero degrees Celsius. So um, some of these events include some freezing rain and also maybe some mixed precipitation as well. Okay, so let's come back to these questions and now there are key takeaways as well. So we looked at how the height of the precipitation phase transition height varied throughout the year. So the higher in the summer, lower in the winter, but substantial spread in transition season months. And then we also looked at differences in the rainfall characteristics, which ultimately brought us to seeing differences in ZR relations and, and um, implications for retrieval. And then we looked at, and so we briefly looked at some ancillary measurements from reanalyses from ERA 5 and MERA 2 to see that um, the melt level height is, uh, agrees well with the phase transition height and the best agreement appears at 1 degree Celsius uh, of wet bulb. And then um, the ERA 5 and MERA 2 are general, generally colder than surface measurements, which has implications for uh, phase discrimination. So satellite retrievals that might depend on a 2 meter wet bulb temperature, they're using um, uh, reanalyses that are cool biased, they might be incorrectly classifying things as snowfall rather than rainfall. Okay, um, with that, thank you for listening. I'm happy to take any questions. I've got one, okay. <laughs> if no one else does. <laughs> I'm still a little bit hung up, Julia, on this uh, interesting notion that collision and um, breakup yeah. might be predominant if you're getting smaller precipitation rates from the high transition heights. So we're getting higher precipitation uh, rates? Okay, but smaller yeah. droplets. Yes. Yeah, that seems weird to me. They have more time to collide and coalesce. Right, so they also have more time to break up. Um, but, but okay, but then why do they, why is there a tendency for them to break up? Or am I just assuming that the tendency is the other way for that for coalescence to occur? So I mean, I might be. I think this is something where I feel like I need a little bit more time to, uh, I think, Grant, are you responding to this question? Or you yeah, have a question? I'm just wondering whether evaporation is also a factor in, in the smaller drops. Um, oh, maybe. Yeah, it, I mean, it's also co-occurring in the same time. Okay, so that might so be So all those processes must be occurring. Also, with evaporation, and thinking about the relative humidity as well. Yes. All right. I think it probably, I'm just going to chime in on this, I think it probably has to do with the fact that when they first form through melting, they're, they're larger mm -hmm. than an equilibrium size, so they, there's a tendency for them to break into a smaller, okay. a smaller size, okay. sure. Okay. And um, there's not as much tendency for them to coalesce because they all come, they all created around the same size. Mm -hmm. And so they're not likely to run into another part of it. Well, I don't get that far. I mean, I do get the pot about the first pot, but well, once they why break are they up, less likely to... Once they break up, you can create some small ones, but yeah. otherwise, the snow is more of a uniform size. Yeah. It's okay. break, it's, it's melting. Yeah. And so, they probably start out fairly narrow distribution, and then it widens over time. And it depends on how much, how much space time they have. How much time they have, but, you know, they're, they're not going to be growing <laughs> much from uh, accretion like they normally would if it was a rising. Yeah. Well, if they're just falling, they're going to be, I mean, breakup's going to be the main game okay. initially until they're a smaller size. And a broader distribution. Yeah. Okay. And then they run out of time. They're only two and a half long inside. But there's nothing to make them grow. Yeah, okay. All right, thanks. I'm sorry to throw that in. That makes no, sense. That's a good question. And that also reminds me, there's been studies comparing drop size distributions of bright band and non-bright band rain. And, and then non-bright band rain being um, warm rain, so having only collision coalescence, and that actually leads to kind of a broader distribution, of, or a narrower distribution than the, um, than the breakup. So it's, it's a little bit different. Okay. I don't mean to distract from that talk. We could probably talk more about that later. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Grant. Yeah, so you're looking at things like your relationships with the relatively inexpensive radar system, like radar, 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 radar. What do we know about its absence of celebration? So, I do not have an answer about the calibration of the specific radar right now. Uh, I could talk to you more about that later. I know that, uh, like, why, uh, and that the White et al. 2002 paper talked about using um, the, for, I guess, for phase transition identification for identifying melting, that using Doppler velocity and signal to noise ratio is good to, because it's 
good regardless of the calibration of the radar, but you bring up a really good point that for using these Z to R relations, I should definitely um, be prepared to talk about the calibration for reflectivity, because that matters for that hearing. Thank you for bringing that up. I don't have an answer. Yes? Uh, I had a question about your um, empirically derived Z to R plots. Mm -hmm. um, did you My first question was just, you have it separated by height, right? Yes. Um, it, is that height in all seasons? Um, yep. Okay, so, so like figure D, that's going to be dominated by like warm seasons. So figure B, this one is a lower phase transition height. Yeah. And so that is most likely winter and spring. Yeah, and, and so in D it will be like mostly yeah. summer. And you're showing the same cold season uh, say to our lines <coughs> before. Right. Okay. Um, could you pull out like just winter time uh, rainfall events that have a high transition and look at what those look like as opposed to all season? That's a great question. And yes, we can. And that's one of the things I'm interested in doing is looking at um, events in the wind in the cold season and also in, in shoulder season months. <coughs> and then. Um, I think you probably said this, but how how much uh, like how long is your uh, So I'm working with observations from January 2014 to April 2020. Okay. So it's about six years. Okay. And the site is still taking observations. It's um, mm -hmm. there will be more soon, you know. <laughs> okay. uh, this is really neat work. Um, I like precipitation <laughs> uh, or rainfall. Um, so I'm curious if you are considering looking at satellite observations to supplement this or looking at the cases where, um, uh, <laughs> sweet, okay, <laughs> yeah, for the cases for where the um, ground observations can no longer detect. So, well, yeah. I'm definitely interested in okay. looking at, um, from GPM, VPR, there's a bright band right. Um, right. Also, CloudZap is uh, interested in seeing, you know, um, how that's, how that's being flagged, how that's being detected. Um, and also, we have a scanning weather radar there, so the next rad, um, radar uh, at KMQT. So we can send people to see lots of different perspectives on these phase transition heights. Cool. Oh, I'm, I'm, I should probably know this, but for the, um, at KMQT, what is, is it still cut off at three kilometers? Um, yeah. So, um, I, I'm not 100% sure. It's definitely a, a, a great it's common program fun. level. Um, although for um, weather radar, there's also a sort of line zone as well. So right. um, close to the radar and far away from the radar, we can skip. Um, so it's it's a range dependent thing. So if we're too far away from the radar, uh, we'll also not be able to detect shallow phase transitions. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it, it would be cool to check check out those variables too. We have dual pull. See, redrive side hand. Yeah. Um, I, I was just thinking, and I might be wrong here, that would it be interesting to look at the, at the previous day observation, like there was a snowfall or rainfall today, you look at the previous days for all the days, and you might see a signature which might be related to whether it was a rainfall or, or a snowfall event. Like how the surface impacts the type of yeah. precipitation? Um, that, that would be interesting. I'm, I mean, I guess it would be cool to do like a case study, pick out one of these rainfall events that happens day after a snowfall event or to see you know how often does that happen that kind of thing? I was thinking about like you pick all your days where the snowfall or rainfall happen and then you select all the previous day or like a couple of previous days and you look at the same thing and whether you see a transition in, in the in the VIP or the, sorry the, the height yep. or something which mm -hmm. which can probably uh, make us understand that how the previous conditions affected the current snowfall or rainfall effect. It, it, uh, I know that for variants who are looking at atmospheric rivers, they look at the like how the conditions, the synoptic conditions, yeah. change with time approaching the spring, uh, the atmospheric river events. And so um, it would be cool to look at. You just pick a few cases and look to see, okay, what are the conditions like? And um, it'd be interesting to also know how many of these are atmospheric rivers and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. cool. mm -hmm. There were a few hands. Go ahead, Terry. <laughs> Terry, I think yeah. you might have been so I'm just kind of wondering, so you were talking about how you're going to compare um, your cloud stat to the, your ground-based radar, right? Mm -hmm. um, It'll I'm be interesting too. Yeah, <laughs> I'm curious about um, 
the frequency of the ground-based radar because mm -hmm. and if they're in the same like size parameter regime. So the um, the weather radar is S band, so similar to the MRR, we can only detect precipitation. We're not going to be detecting any clouds. Whereas clouds that will be able to detect um, the ice, snow, and ice above melt level and actually attenuates at the melt level, we won't be able to detect everything um, below if it fully attenuates. And then um, GPM VR is um, it's there's so there's two radars. There's KU and KA. I can just add to that. I've looked at GPM matched up to um, just a spatial map of Marquette, and you can look better at GPM data than CloudSat because there's a lot less. Whereas GPM has the scanning radar, and actually it's not too difficult to spatially and temporally match those. So you can look at um, what the GPM surface precipitation estimate is from that. Yeah, I was just more curious about like because um, they're in different CloudSat, I would imagine that the ground based radars would be a different frequency than CloudSat and there then you'd be in a different size parameter. Um, and I think CloudSat wouldn't use the ZDR relation. As so, much, so I was curious what I wouldn't be applying like a Z to R relation to CloudSat. I would um, and uh, yeah CloudSat's at a different wavelength and um, what it would be more interesting to see, okay, with these profiles, what it just looking at reflectivity, what are these profiles looking like compared to nearby Marquette uh, MRR observation. So more of a qualitative comparison at this point. Um, I, I don't work with satellite observation yet, so I, I can't tell you exactly the steps that I would take. Okay, thank you. Yes. Uh, yeah, um, have you looked at uh, the vertical profile of spectrum width um, to see if there's any implications on uh, broadening or narrowing of the PSD from the surface to the cloud base? Many implications I guess for um, various uh, um, right band heights. Right. So I have looked at spectral width a little bit, and the spectral width um, for the MRRs gives us fairly similar information as a Doppler velocity. You see uh, like an increase in the reflect uh, in the spectral width associated with that phase transition height, and then also um, we see other features in the in the spectral width associated with like turbulent motion. Um, so we can't detect clouds using the MRR, so any of the variance that we see in the spectral width is only in the precipitation. Um, so I don't know how much that answered your question. <laughs> Let me know. Yeah, I, I, yeah um, I guess it's more so if you look at the spectral width at the surface and the cloud base where precipitation is falling. Inferences on the, the size of the drops, but if, if, they, if they're comparable to what you see in the um, drop in velocity, I guess it makes okay. sense. So I haven't used spectral width in that way of like, okay, what's the spectral width at the surface? What's the spectral width, like the actual the values and stuff um, at the I guess base transition height? Because I don't know if we're you know close to cloud base, especially with the range in the three kilometer operating range height. Um, so it would be interesting to compare that. I haven't done that yet. It's another variable to look at. Um, I saw Brad's hand go up before. You show the bias, full bias in the surface, the fall temperature, and then you also had to, you got the best agreement with the mount layer height of what degree mm -hmm. offset. Seems like those are those pretty much the same biases? Or does it say that the whole the analyses are, they have an overall constant uh, of So that is a good question. I haven't started to kind of look at that story together yet. I've sort of, at this point, I've looked at them kind of separate, um, kind of thinking of that, okay, that melt level height, that could be used with a satellite um, you know, retrieval type thing where they're interested in freezing melt level heights. Um, and then I've thought of that two meter well well temperature sort of a, a separate thing, a separate entity at the moment. And that's kind of a next step for me, is yeah. ma making that connection. Um, what I have seen in um, a number of the profiles is inversions. And so that's a whole other thing that, that kind of changes the way I want to approach right. that thinking. So it's, it's sort of like my next thing that I'm like, I need to think about that next. So is I appreciate your thought. So not, uh, not at this site. Okay. Um, yeah. So I think there's, 
the one in Green Bay, and then I think there's there's another one somewhere nearby. Um, I'm not, I can't remember the location, but um, not at this site, no. Um, I think I saw Greg's hand in that grant. I may have missed this, but did you um, look at the sensitivity of these uh, relationships with cloud top height? I did not. Um, also, it would, with these observations, um, would, or from my ground-based instrument suite, I don't have um, cloud top height information. Um, I would need to obtain that probably using the analyses or sort of like figuring out a way to get to it. Um, so I've not done that. I would think cloud top height would affect crystal concentration right. strongly, and then that would affect the size of melting. Right, right, yeah, yeah, definitely important for that, that the snow processes above the melt level height. Because that, the, well, if we're seeing, you know, aggregation occurring in the column, that's going to influence what we actually get in the melt layer. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that is, that would, you know, the, the cloud height is sort of a little bit difficult with this instrument speed, though. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just yeah. satellites is what I was yeah. thinking. Right, that's, that would be fun. That's what I'm using, it's cloud sets information. So we need to That would be a fun next step, too. All these new ideas. <laughs> Grant, you can hand. Yeah, since bulk temperature depends on bulk temperature, do you have a sense yet as to whether the bias is the temperature or the or bulk? That is a very good question, and I would like to write that down. <laughs> um, I don't know. And, and together in, in that order kind of help visualize what's going on. Um, let me know if I should try again. Yeah, I'm not sure. Okay. So I wish I had a perfect idea. I have a lot of extra slides too. Okay. So these are um, profiles of the whole temperature. And these don't have an inversion. But basically what I'm saying is that if we have zero aloft and then the temperature um, then does so basically, it's, my code is looking for that instance of one degrees, um, what bulk temperature, and so if that's happening closer to the surface, then the actual phase transition still happened above that time, or above that. But in general, we're still seeing a good drink with one degree Celsius. So, so if, if you're thinking of like the lowest place where it's one degree, but mm -hmm. so it might be happening. Right, right the melting is actually happening. Okay. Yes. Uh, I was just wondering if you had any further thoughts about the spatial variance plot that you showed. I, I guess okay. that, to that plot you were saying that the 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 phase transition height is not related to the local thermodynamic profile, right? I think it was like it is not related to the zero degree temperature. Oh, the, from the introduction, the yeah. um. Yes. yes. This? Yeah, I was just wondering like, if you have any really, really thoughts about what those changes would be related to. Is it just like related to synoptic scale measures oh. or topography? So these regional differences in yeah. the temperature transition. Um, so I think it's uh, related to a bunch of things. One of those things is probably uh, elevation and topography and um, also uh, pressure. So that the actual phase transition and even when we think about like what bulk temperature, the variables that go into it, is we think about the pressure, the relative humidity, so the moisture in the atmosphere impacts what phase we're getting. 
And then also, uh, thinking about transition heights, if we have a transition height that is uh, close <coughs> to the surface, and snow, snow could be surviving closer to the surface, even, and we actually had an event like that next week, or last week, where we saw a lot of snow um, above freezing. I don't know if you all remember that. It was kind of fun. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I hope that helped a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. All right. Thanks, everybody, for the great discussion. <laughs> Thanks,